I think I'm going to call this video Ode to the Cookie Monster. And what we have here is a couple of 40cc class saws. The, the one I just did a first impression on was that Makita uh, 4300 series. There's an old Husqvarna 42. And there's a John Thread 455. Now all those saws are roughly in the same displacement class. They all have different bar and chains. And really how fast they cut doesn't matter as much as how easy they are to operate, work with, and all that kind of stuff. And I went through that. There's a couple of advantages of Makita over these older saws before we even get started. First, the anti-vibe is a little bit more sophisticated than both of those older Swedish saws. Second, it's got a primer bulb. Third, it's just a more modern saw in a lot of ways. Uh, everything from the chain brake to the way the levers work and the carburetor all that is just a more modern saw. It has a spring assist pull start. Basically, it's a nice little saw. Now, why I'm doing this is kind of like redemption because I had run the Husqvarna 543 and there were some who saw that as, well, geez, if you did this, that, and the other thing, change a bar and chain, muffler mod, this and that, it would have made up the difference. But the net, net, net was the Makita had more power. More weight, but more power. And I tried to make the point in that video, it really didn't matter. That wasn't the point of these saws. That both the 543 and the Makita are very, very nice saws. And for their intended purposes, you can't go wrong with either one. And I'll stand by that. But because folks kind of brought it up, I figured maybe I ought to bring some old standbys out so you can understand where the Makita sits in history as compared to some of the other saws that are out there. Not just the 543, but that was the 1980s 40cc offering for Husqvarna. Went from a 234 all the way up to a 246. There's a whole series of them. I've got the 238 and it's a snorting little saw. And that was John Thread's homeowner offering. So that John Thread right there actually matches up closer to the Makita in terms of the market they were trying to uh, sell to. Where the, that version of the Husky was a more pro level saw. Now in terms of bar and chain, you got the 3 8 low pro on the Makita. And I've got the Oregon speed cut on that just for an evaluation. So basically I just pulled that thing out of the of the uh, retirement home as it went in there, which means it had some use on it. So I really don't know where that chain is in terms of where. I just know it has time. And the same with that one there. That chain there has got a fair amount of time on it. I did a lot of the brush work for the road with that particular saw. I think some of that crept into the video. But anyway, I'm gonna tell you right up front, it don't matter a hill of beans which one of these saws cuts faster to me. They all have a place in my heart and they have a place in the farm. And no matter how fast these other saws or how slow they are, right? That Makita is going to sit in my tractor because it's just a very practical saw. Simple as that. So, but to those who care, we'll do some cookies on a little bit bigger log, which is going to test their power a little bit more. And the way I see it is the 42, if it's got a decent chain, probably has the most power of the three of them. That one there will probably run out of gas and start going lean before it gets through the log. But I still did a lot of work with it. And that's just going to do what it always does and just does a, you know, workman type job. It just gets through the work and just keeps on chugging. And now that I've got a few tanks through, it's beginning to show some characteristics that I like. It's just a stable saw. Now, the other reason I did this is because the Dolmar fans are somewhat taken aback that this series is now made in China. At least that's my understanding. That saw was made in China. I want to make the point again that the location of the manufacturer doesn't really matter as long as the material specifications and the manufacturing tolerances are held. And since Makita has that factory as their facility, chances are that's just as well built as the German counterpart 
when it had a Dolmar tag on it, assuming they had one in that class. I don't know the Dolmar series at all, so I really don't know if that has a history in the Dolmar line or not. I do know it has a Makita tag on it, and I do know it's a very nice little saw. So without further ado, we'll let them do their thing on a little bit bigger piece of wood. And that's not the hardest kind of wood, that's basswood, and I guess it's considered a hardwood. But for what I have out here in the Rubicon Ridge Farms, that's softwood for me. You know what I'm saying? So I don't really see why these little saws can't dig their way through that log. But we will see how they perform. This will be a short video. And it'll just be the cookie monster. That's what it's going to be called. People will derive out of it what they want. I do think that one of the more relevant subjects on these saws is how easy do they start. Okay? That matters to me a lot more than whether or not it's one or two seconds slower in a big log. You know what I'm saying? So, to start the party, since the wood is larger on that end, I'm going to run the Husqvarna first, because I think it probably has the most power. And then I'll run the John's Thread last. So let's see how hard it is to get this thing started. And yeah, need a little choke. Okay, well, that's how a 42 cuts, and that's really not bad. The chain is okay. It's not great. You can see from the chips that some of them are big, and some of them are small, some of them are pretty dusty. But that chain's got a fair amount of time on it. So let's do the next saw. By the way, just start and restart on that saw for a saw that doesn't have a primer bulb is excellent. Because I got some shoulder issues.
How do you beat that? What I'm seeing here, this is just me because I have a different metric than a lot of people, is the magnesium split cases, the basic layout of this saw. This might be an alternative to those guys who really like those 42 series saws. This is a modern, currently sold saw that has a lot of the same basic characteristics. Upright cylinder, roughly the same displacement, split magnesium cases, cylinder split to where you can take it off and deck it if you choose to. So what I look at when I see something like this is as much as I like my little huskies, this is one a person can pick up and start hacking on, modifying, and not worry about not being able to get parts like you can't get parts for the Husky. So for a person looking for the same class of saw and wants to build it into a hot rod, this is a much, much better place to start. And it does have features like a better two-point mount chain brake handle and uh, the, the primer bulb and things like that. So as much as there's a lot of nostalgia about the little Husqvarna, that's a better saw for a person like me and probably a person like you. Whereas that's a better saw for a collector and somebody who is nostalgic about Husqvarna and somebody who appreciates that era saw because that's a, as Bob likes to say, that punch is above its, its weight class for what it is. And that's a, that saw was built in the 80s. 90s, 2000s, that's a 25, 30 year old saw and it performs in the same level as this brand new saw. So that's the good news about the Husky, but you can't buy it and you can't find parts for it. This is like the new 42 for me. Now I'm sure the Dolmer guys are gonna go, yeah, I see that. But as I said over and over, this is not about brands. This is about the saw hobby. Now, one last point is the smaller bar and the chain that's on that Makita, it took a lot less effort for me to push it through the wood. You know, it's, it was sort of self-feeding where the Oregon speed cut with it wear and tear on it, I had to lay on that saw. I could push on the Husqvarna saw harder than I could push on the Makita. So in my mind, even though the times might be close, the feel of the Husqvarna said it had more power. Not much, but more. But what it had was more torque, where I could lay on that saw and jam that dull chain through the wood and still get some decent chips. And I'm telling you, take out that cat muffler, do a muffler mod and a base gasket delete, and that key is sitting there right with it. So the times here don't really matter. So how about this one? This one here probably is not in the same power class as either one of those two. But it's a nice little saw. here doesn't have a kill switch so by plugging it out with a choke it's not going to restart as easy as those other two probably two poles but that's not because uh, the saw wouldn't pull on the first start if it had a kill switch and you didn't have to flood it out to stop it it's just it doesn't have one so it's not in the same class power-wise as either one of those two. So I think the takeaway from this, what I hope people take away from this, is it doesn't really matter where it's made. It's a nice little saw. It's a nice design. It does the same kind of things that the Husqvarna uh, 42 and 238 in that series of saw did 30 years ago, you know? And they really don't have anything in their lineup that's like this, sort of simple, 
you know, lower tech. And uh, nice little saw, nice chassis. For a person just wanting to run it the way it is, it obviously has power to do that. It's a good, good running saw. But for the person who wants to modify something, you know, the simple things we do on this channel, base gasket delete, muffler mods, and stuff like that, this is a much better place to start if you actually want to use your saw because the parts are out there and available. So that's my point. So that's my video. This is Cookie Monsters. And the reason I call it that is because that doesn't matter, you know different bar, different chain, they're both in the same class. People will read into this stuff and like I got a comments on on this one versus the 543 if you change the bar and chain, you did this, you did that. The point is with these saws for working on wood six inches and down, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Just let them do their thing and they're very very useful in uh, this one here is available, and I think that's the deciding factor if a person's trying to get into that class of saw. So, anyway, talk to you later. Bye for now. I'm going fishing. So we have our test logs out here. It's a beautiful day. And I don't know why I did this video. I think it's because some of the comments, I don't post all the comments that come up on the channel. They do a fair amount. And the, the whole thing about cookies kind of gets my goat a little bit because people read so much into the cookies and at times. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, that when you start looking at the different characteristics of the bar and the chain, the tune, the wood changes, you really can't read too much into cookies. You got three very nice little saws right there. Every one of those have a place in my um, fleet of saws and all three of them are going to get used. The Makita is a loner, although the more I use it the more I like it I'll probably buy one. Uh, that's my classic and the reason I really like it is because for what it is it really runs strong. It's an old saw. Oh my god that thing's got so much time on it. And Tonight, you're not going to see its true colors with the bar and chain that it has. Had I put the Sujihara with the chain I had on before, you know, you'd have a much faster looking saw, but that misses the whole point. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, rambling.
pretty close. This saw right there is a 70E and it's hampered by two things. It's a little down in compression, which I think is going to come back if I run it some. And it's got an 8 2 sprocket and it really should have a 7. So you got to be really gentle with it because it really, you have to let the chain self feed. And then third, that bar and chain uh, doesn't cut as well as it should. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to it, but when things are a little bit off, you kind of push and it's like cracking a shell, it begins to cut as compared to just self-feeding its way through. That one has that crack the shell and then push, but if you push too far or if you push too hard, it wants to stall. So there's a really fine spot where it will cut. And it isn't so much the saw as it is the combination of all those things. A little bit down in power, because a little bit down in compression. The bar and chain, I bet there's a little bit of a burr on that bar. All that's aggravated because it's got an eight tooth versus a, uh, a seven tooth sprocket. But I'm liking that little 4300. And uh, I kind of knew I would, which is why I went for it. I've been kind of itching to get my way into that class of saw for a couple of years. So for those who, who uh, think that I just started jumping on the bandwagon, not really. It's just I'd never had a source of, of those saws to work from, you know. It was offered, I just didn't have the time either. And now I have the time and the interest. So I want to go back and visit some of those, those type of saws. You know, the ones that are not spectacular. It's not like a 500i from Steel or a 572 from Husqvarna. But the kind of saw an average person's going to buy. I kind of want to wander through those. And and I want to say it right now, is I don't want to have it where it's a comparison where, oh, this one's better than this saw. Because in that range, I don't think that's really a legitimate argument. I mean, they're all good, is the point. And if you have a decent dealer, that's the way you want to go. And, uh, and that's about all I got to say about that. But that whole class of saws is I'll do the cookies because people want me to. But really, getting into the, which one's faster, which one's better, which one, you know, by the numbers, by this, the spec sheet comparisons, on a test log, on, a, on one given day, to have that kind of a discussion, I think, really is a waste of time. It's my humble opinion. They're all nice. There's a lot of them that are nice. And when you've got it and it cuts on an afternoon and you're getting your firewood done, that's the best saw in the world right there, you know, regardless of the brand. You know, I guess another question is that versus like the, the uh, clone saws. Well, that's a tough one. And, you know, some of the clone saws with development turn out to be pretty good. I got the 660s to work pretty well, you know. That was a legitimate effort, but it took me, what, two or three years to get to a formula or a recipe that I could replicate and then put in the hands of someone like a Matt, the logger, and actually have it perform. To this point in time, I have not run into a kit saw that out of the box with the parts that are in that box regardless of the price and even the assembled saws I have yet to see one that performs as well as that Makita does out of the box and um, there's a message in there and the message has to do with the people who design it understand it understand how to manufacture it and then replicate as it was designed to be replicated versus those who try to build off of somebody else's design. I think, um, I think it's actually kind of interesting if a person wants to think about it. You have the Chinese Makita and you have the other saws that are kit saws. And the Makita works right out of the box. No messing around. It's because it's their design. Where we've developed some of the kit saws to work well, but it took development because it's not their design. They don't understand the saw. It's basically a collection of parts from different vendors, you know, jumbled into a box. Don't get me wrong. There's a purpose for those, and I had a lot of fun with them. I'm not trying to say that's not a bad approach, but you have that common denominator being built in China. Some people want to label the clone saws as Chinese, therefore not as good. Well, there's a Makita that's Chinese and it's really good. So it has nothing to do with where it's built. It has everything to do with the people understanding the design and understanding the manufacturing tolerances required to replicate that design. 
And that's the takeaway. And to the people who deal with the farmer techs, I've had a lot of fun with them. I'm not down in that stuff. I've had just a lot of fun with it.